Hello, my name is Abla Pratt. I'm a senior at Middlebury College and majoring in political science. I'm so glad to welcome you to an episode in our virtual career exploration series called MidVantage, Careers on Capitol Hill. This series is gonna focus on how US Congress works. You'll get to hear from many members of the Middlebury community who work on different issues, both in and around Capitol Hill in Washington, DC. There will help us learn more about how to enter this challenging and rewarding field. To kick off this series, we're very lucky to be joined by Professor Matt Dickinson, who teaches political science at Middlebury College. He joined the faculty in 2000 and teaches courses on American politics, the presidency, and the politics of Congress. His current focus, research focus is on recent presidents, advisors, and presidential decision making. Professor Dickinson graduated from Boston College and received his master's and doctorate from Harvard University, studying under uh, presidential scholar Richard Newstead. Professor Dickinson, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Abbott. Glad to be with you. I'm also glad to be with you virtually. Hopefully we'll be uh, in person here on campus in a little bit. You know, this is the first episode in this series on uh, exploring Capitol Hill. So I kind of just want to start off with broad overview of how Congress works. So 1787, Constitution's written. Very first article establishes US Congress. How do the founders structure this legislative branch? Um, what makes the US bicameral legislature unique? And kind of how has this changed as the nation's grown um, in the preceding years? Great question. So the framers coming off this revolution and with a long history um, drawing just not on colonial government, but also under the recent Articles of Confederation and British history under um, the parliamentary system of government, which evolved it significantly during their lifetime, they had a good idea of what they wanted to do here. And writing Article One, which as you point out, lays out the sort of the foundation for a Congress, two things strike you. One is the emphasis on frequent elections. Um, they saw this as a guide to uh, ensuring our elected representatives are accountable to the people and as a safeguard against tyranny, which they just fought a war against. Um, the second thing is it's bicameral. Um, and what this means is the form of election, um, although election is important both to the House and to the Senate, the way elections take place, or at least initially envisioned, differed in the House and the Senate. So anything pertaining to the House, um, election looms really uh, large in the calculations of members, and it's designed that way. So over time, each member of the House represents a single district. They're a single member, we call them SMSP elections, single member, simple plurality. That means members are responsible for representing um, what is now uh, 700,000 person districts, but were originally envisioned to be 30,000 districts. And every two years they go before those people and they're held accountable. The Senate is slightly different. At least it was envisioned to be different. The terms are longer, six years, and initially they were selected by state legislatures. Since the 17th Amendment, that has changed. So senators too are popularly elected, but the size of the states vary dramatically. Um, from California with 30 million people to um, Vermont with 600,000 and everything in between. So if you're a student and you're going to Congress, the most important thing to know is really two aspects. One, the importance of election. Members of Congress are single-minded seekers of re-election and that permeates everything they do. Uh, you can't exaggerate that. And two, it's a bicameral institution, which means the election process, the incentive plays out differently in the Senate and the House. Awesome. Yeah. So I kind of want to talk about that distinction a little bit, too. So as you mentioned, we have the House and the Senate, House with 435 members, um, mentioned different, different based on the population of the state, um, and the Senate with 100 senators, two for each state, um, and kind of that term length. So every 435 members of the House is up for election every uh, two years, every election year. And then um, the senators have six-year terms with a third each class coming up um, every every two years. So you're only electing a third of the new senators. How, what effect does this have kind of on those inner workings of Congress between the Senate and the House with those different uh, paradigms in place? Great question. Um, there's a, a story, perhaps apocryphal, uh, which Thomas Jefferson came back. He hadn't attended the Constitutional Convention and asked Washington to describe the difference between the House and the Senate. And Washington picked up a teacup and a saucer. And he said, the teacup is the house. It holds the hot, boiling passions of the people. The saucer is the Senate. It's supposed to um, let those passions cool and a more deliberative process. 
that distinction still holds today. The Senate, uh, although as you correctly point out, a third of it is up for election every two years. Members serve for six year terms. So they are a little less responsive directly to the passions of the day than is the House, which by necessity is quite um, reactive to what's happening in the world. Um, this means too that uh, the lawmaking processes and uh, um, the decisions within each institution are somewhat different too in terms of their time horizon. So you'll know if you intern in the Senate versus interning in the House, the House is um, individual members are much more sensitive to outreach to their, their constituents. The Senate is engaged in that, but less so. But when you look at the Senate, that type of representation dramatically uh, differs depending on whether you're in California or whether you're in Vermont, for instance. And it plays out in very interesting ways. So for instance, um, in terms of the distribution of federal aid, it turns out per capita, small states have more clout in the Senate than large states. Um, and this just has to do with the fact that there's two members representing the Senate in Vermont for 700,000 people. Uh, and there's two representing California with 30 million people. And the relative clout of those individuals from um, California is simply less in the lawmaking process um, because they have to represent so many different interests. The other difference between House and Senate is the nature of their constituencies. Typically, House constituencies are more homogenous. You have a liberal uh, 700,000 people densely populated Ocasio-Cortez, AOC represents in New York City. It's a very liberal district. She wins with 80% of the vote. And you can move from there to a district like uh, Montana, where you have 700,000 people spread out in a huge geographic area. The nature of representation, even though the districts are the same size, is much different. If you go to the Senate, it even is the differences are even much more pronounced because here the actual number of constituents differs dramatically and so your representational experience is going to be different if i want to talk to peter welch or bernie sanders or patrick Leahy, i have much easier access in vermont than if i'm trying to talk to my senator from california um, because i'm competing with a lot fewer people for sure, that's something that, I mean, I worked on Capitol Hill last summer and I worked on the House side for my Congresswoman and that was something we were really keyed on was that constituent service, both because it relates back to the, if you're a good constituent service and your constituents know that you're out there helping them, it helps with that reelection aspect that you talked about every two years, but also you have, you're that more direct person. It's only the 700,000 people or so rather than, I mean, Iowa is a little bit smaller than California, say we only have 3 million people, but still a lot easier to access one of our four uh, congresswomen or congressmen than, than it is to access one of the senators. Um, but could we add to have it before, yeah. uh, just to, to drive home that point, if I'm representing 700 districts in Vermont, uh, 700 constituents in Vermont, it's a largely liberal agrarian state. It's easier to represent that than a state like California that has, you know, the San Fernando Valley agriculture, has entertainment district in LA, has um, you know, the wine country in Sonoma, um, the representational experience is uh, different because the constituents are much more varied in a larger state than in a small state or a house district. For sure. I want to zoom in now and talk a little bit about the internal dynamics of Congress, um, both kind of in like big picture, like what is the function of the legislative branch? Obviously, legislates right there in the name, but how does that happen? Um, kind of both through the Senate and House lens. Great question. Um, so Article 1 is fairly specific in, in assigning certain powers to Congress um, compared to, for instance, Article 2 of the Constitution, which is really vague about presidential powers. And the focus in Article 1 is on the lawmaking process. And a couple of things, again, stand out. One is, of course, um, it assigns the taxing power to the House, that chamber that's um, more closely accountable to the people. And through tradition, and we can talk about this later, appropriations um, that is the spending power is also typically um, the, the lead is taken in the House and then the Senate has to concur. Um, but as a lawmaking body, there's a sequence laid out there. Now, the, the sort of the basic framework of lawmaking is laid out in Article 1, so you need concurrence on legislation from the House and the Senate, and then it goes to the President. Remember, the President, although not a member of Congress, is a member of the lawmaking process. That's what I mean by shared powers under the Constitution. 
And what this means is there's plenty of opportunities for intense vocal minorities to block or shape the lawmaking process. The most distinctive thing when you're distinguishing between the US system of shared power and a parliamentary system, a prototypical parliamentary system, is in the United States, power is fragmented. Uh, and to get anything done, you must build coalitions. And that requires navigating frequent obstacle points. And over time, those obstacle points have multiplied. Most noticeably, and we can talk about this perhaps a little bit later, um, with the development of the committee system. So when the House was initially created, we had 13 states, um, and uh, we had a much smaller Senate, and of course, a smaller House than we do now with 435 members. It was easier to make law in interpersonal discussions on the floor of the House. That's no longer possible. So the lawmaking process has become specialized. So individual members of the House, and to a lesser extent the Senate, will um, participate in that lawmaking process at key junctures and take an intense interest when that lawmaking affects their constituents. Otherwise, they sort of rely on cues provided by other members of their party and determining how they vote. So lawmaking is sequential, it's incremental, it allows for vocal intense interest to block it. And so typically we do not get laws unless there is broad support for that. And it means more bills die in Congress than see the light. Um, and by die, I mean they're submitted in the hopper um, and they never go anywhere. They don't even get um, out, of, out of committee. So it is a very arduous process when it comes to lawmaking. Of course, the second function that we might wanna talk about is representation. and um, that uh, opens up a whole nother uh, area of discussion. I wonder if we can go on that first one a little bit and kind of dive in and talk a little bit about the committee structure, um, especially because that is another opportunity that both students have both to intern or also like recent grads to work in. You can actually work just for a committee rather than an individual member um, of Congress. How, how do those committees work? What do those committees, what does that committee structure look like? So again, early in the nation's history, Congress um, began, um, deciding rather than uh, inefficiently addressing every bill with all members on the floor, why doesn't it, uh, it'll make more sense if we refer them to committees and the committees will specialize um, and then they can report out the initial um, framework of a bill and then the full house and uh, in the Senate, the full Senate can debate that. The nature of that system has remained in place pretty much since about the 1830s. The number of committees has um, varied dramatically. Uh, the current structure really dates from the 1940s when Congress um, paired off, eliminated a number of what had become increasingly superfluous committees. But essentially the way the lawmaking process goes is somebody will submit a bill, a member of Congress on behalf of an interest group or their own interest or a citizen, and it will be assigned to a committee. Um, and there's a scheduling process that um, sort of determines under what sequence these bills are taken up. Once on committee, the members, and the committees are normally organized to roughly represent the balance of power in the overall chamber. So if the Democrats have 55% uh, of the seats, it's a 10-person committee, they'll have six members of the committee, the Republicans will have four, and the Democrats will chair that committee. Each committee um, typically has a number of subcommittees, which are further specialized, and they will typically consider uh, take a first crack at the legislation, although um, increasingly, and we can sort of get into the weeds here, um, that process has been bypassed. But under the traditional lawmaking process, the bill was first referred to a subcommittee. They will do something called a markup period. Um, so they may ask people to come in to testify, and then they will literally write up a bill, a markup bill, and then will be considered by the full committee. And if the full committee approves that, they send it out to the floor where once again, it is subject to an amending process and debate. And if that chamber passes it, you gotta do it all over again uh, in identical form in the other chamber. And if the other chamber comes out with a slightly different version, they've gotta be reconciled before it goes on to the president. So again, this is just a way of reiterating the point that you and I made at the start of this, which is this is a very lengthy process, one which is, allows many veto points. Sure, much more arduous than that traditional parliamentary system. Absolutely. Uh, for sure. I wonder if we could touch a little bit on just some bigger topics that are going to be uh, explored more in depth later on in this uh, video series. Uh, first and foremost, the appropriations process uh, that happens every year. It's a big deal. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Sure. The, so the Appropriations Committee traditionally is one of the power committees in the House and its counterpart in, in the Senate holds a similar um, prominent role. Um, and as the name suggests, the Appropriations Committee is responsible for passing appropriations bill. And they have um, a, a, a dozen, 13 subcommittees. Um, that number has varied somewhat. Um, which are responsible for divvying up the appropriations process. So you'll have a subcommittee dealing with agricultural appropriations, one dealing with defense, and so on. Uh, and under the lawmaking process, uh, Congress has evolved a two-step process. Uh, they have authorizing committees, and then they have the appropriating committees. The authorization process is the process essentially of writing a check. Um, so it essentially says, we've authorized you to spend X amount of money on the military. Uh, but then that check actually has to be cashed. That is, the, through the appropriations process, Congress then has to say, okay, we agree to spend that amount of money that's been authorized. So there's a two-step process here, an additional check. Uh, and it means traditionally the appropriations people, and if you are lucky enough to work on the appropriations committees, um, wield tremendous power. Um, now, in recent decades, because of the increasing polarization of Congress and um, an additional step in the budgeting process. Um, there's an effort here to sort of restrict spending or gain some control over spending. There's a budgeting resolution that precedes appropriation um, that dates from the 1970s. But the general rule here still holds. If you wanna understand uh, legislating, in particular, the appropriations process in Congress, it's a two-step process. Authorizing, that is basically saying, this is what we want, Congress to do, and then agreeing to spend the money that has been authorized on that particular task. For sure. The second point I think would be cool to explore and uh, interesting for everyone listening, and again, it's going to be explored more in a future episode, um, is kind of that oversight power that Congress has um, over the executive branch um, and over itself, perhaps most notably with the recent impeachment. Um, but just in general, can you talk a little bit about that? oversight sure. process? Yeah, so we should be clear here when we talk about the functions of Congress, I've mentioned two so far. Lawmaking, obviously, is the one that most people know about. Representation, um, which involves lawmaking, but also broader issues. But the third, as you correctly point out, is oversight. In a system of separated institutions sharing power, we think about the president as part of the lawmaking process. Congress is part of the executive process. Congress has a stake in once passing a bill, to ensure that bill is implemented the way they intended. And they do that through oversight. And impeachment is only the most controversial and also I would argue in some ways the least important of the oversight functions. A lot of oversight just takes place through congressional testimony. And again, if you're a student and you go down there, you may be asked to be part of that oversight process by um, working on um, investigating aspects of what an executive branch has done. Now, when we talk about specialization of Congress, part of that specialization centers on oversight. There are certain congressional committees whose primary purpose is to conduct oversight of their counterpart in the executive branch. And one thing you probably saw, Abbott, in your experience there is much of what Congress does in oversight takes place at the staff level with individual staff members of Congress consulting with their counterparts, the staff members in the executive branch. And a lot of that is behind the scenes. It doesn't take place in the visible public hearings that you often see on C-SPAN, but it's a crucial part of Congress's role as an oversight body. Um, if you go to the testimony, these, um, uh, these oversight hearings, you'll often see a staff member sitting behind a member of Congress, handing them notes, reminding them. Because remember, these members of Congress are torn in many different directions and they rely heavily on their staff and staying informed about what's happening in a particular committee hearing. So staff, and uh, that includes interns, are playing a crucial role in this oversight process. No, that's for sure. It's, it's certainly a place with, even as an intern or someone who's a recent grad just out of college, um, working as, as you mentioned, just a staffer or a legislative assistant or anything like that, you can have a really big impact in that way um, because members of Congress rely on their staff so, so much. I wonder if we could just touch a little bit on that third um, part of, we talked a little bit about oversight, uh, but now diving a little bit into representation uh, as that third aspect of how, how what Congress is supposed to do. 
Sure. So if you become a member of a congressional staff, and students often ask, how, should, how do I get my foot in the door here? What can I uh, do? And I often encourage them to work locally in the representation side. So most members of Congress, they have staff that deals with lawmaking and representation in Washington, D.C., but they typically have an office or several offices in the case of the Senate uh, in large states back home in their district. Um, and you can work out of those offices as well. And they're engaged in all sorts of casework. Um, casework is wonderful for a member of Congress because it's nonpartisan uh, and it has unalloyed benefits. Nobody ever gets mad at you for finding their social security check or um, referencing your son or daughter uh, to the Congressional Research Service to help them write their paper for Middlebury College. I know that never happens. Um, or um, engaging in uh, bringing home the bacon Members of Congress love to announce grants here in Vermont, cleaning up Lake Champlain, bringing in a water treatment plant, a grant for libraries. This is pure, unalloyed electoral benefits, and both parties revel in it. And that's part of the representational experience. The other thing that's crucial here is reminding voters that you are on their side and communicating with them. And that used to take place through print, the, the, what we call the franking privilege, which is taxpayer subsidized communications between members of Congress and their constituents. Um, social media has now broadened the method, but the purpose is the same. It's to remind people what your representative or senator is doing for you, and they love to remind you. And as a staff member, you will get very adept at that. You will come in there and they will give you a protocol, whether you are answering letters or here's how you answer a phone call. And heaven help me, I've had students who have screwed up that protocol. And unfortunately, it's, uh, it's not a good thing for their career prospects. Fortunately, it's rare. If you take direction well, you'll understand the protocol. But the reason it's so important is because it is a crucial aspect of that reelection imperative. Um, and every member of Congress uh, depends on their present their best face forward at all times in dealing with constituents. And that's something for sure that as an intern, I very much had a firsthand uh, glance into both, as you mentioned, answering the phone, responding to letters. Um, I remember a big part of there was some really bad flooding in our district um, early on in the spring, as tends to happen in Iowa, and the Congresswoman got a bunch of money to help with flood assistance um, and doing a bunch of casework with that. Um, obviously a huge part and then also a huge part of working out of the constituent office um, in, in the district, which I think is something too that people don't always think about um, when they think about Capitol Hill. They're like, oh, I want to go work in DC. I want to work on the Hill. Um, there is a whole other side of this uh, of actually helping the people uh, who, who these members of Congress represent, which can also be really, really valuable. Um, and as you mentioned, a nice stepping stone to perhaps working uh, in, in the actual Absolutely. office. Absolutely. Yeah. I want to zoom out a little bit more now and kind of talk about like broad trends of Congress over time. Um, so how has Congress changed since its inception? Obviously, we've grown a lot as a nation. You mentioned that these congressional districts are a lot larger. Um, when we first started, the states were probably all a lot more equally sized. Two senators representing made a lot more sense. Now we have Vermont on one end and California on another. Um, but what other trends have there been uh, in the change of Congress over time? Well, that's a great question. Uh, and I've often teach students that when you think about Congress, uh, the two most important internal structures are committees, which we've discussed a little bit, and parties. And generally speaking, the argument I've made is that when parties, the two major political parties, um, and because of the way we elect members of Congress, we usually typically only have two major parties um, because of the single member, first past the post, simple plurality election system, it doesn't allow for third parties to get representation, which is an, an important uh, a component of how our system differs from a parliamentary system. But when you look at those two major parties, um, you consider them today to be ideologically distinct. So if I'm a conservative, I'm a Republican. If I'm a liberal, I'm a Democrat. You and I sort of take that for granted. But 50 years ago, that wasn't the case. You would have conservative Democrats, you would have liberal Republicans. Um, and historically, when parties are internally divided, as they were 50 years ago, parties cannot um, organize. You don't want to give a lot of authority if you're a rank and file member to your party leader because that party leader might do something in the name of the party that is contrary to what you believe. So if I'm a Southern Democrat, I may not support 
Lyndon Johnson pushing civil rights. Um, but as parties become more internally homogenous, then you're much more willing to sort of uh, entrust your electoral future to your party leaders. That's what's happened to the two major parties in the last 50 years. They have become internally homogenous. As a result, the power of committees has weakened. It used to be if I was the chair of the Appropriations Committee or the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, I was a power unto myself. But that's less likely to be the case today. When you look at Congress today, we have two very homogenous parties ideologically, very liberal Democrats, very conservative Republicans. And as a result, there's much more emphasis on team building, brand name building, and much more willingness of rank and file to close ranks behind their leadership and do what their leadership wants. That permeates everything that happens on Capitol Hill today in a way that had you interned 50 years ago, uh, it, it would have been an entirely different experience. There would have been much more bipartisanship much more cross-pollination in terms of ideas and willingness to cross the aisle. That's not the case today. We are in a period of polarization um, in Congress, um, compounded by the fact that the parties are evenly matched that we have not seen since the aftermath of the Civil War in the 1870s through the 1890s period. And so that makes like Nancy Pelosi as the Speaker of the House wield way more power now, or Mitch McConnell as the Senate Majority Leader, uh, than would traditionally be. Is that kind of what you're saying? Exactly right. In particularly in the House, the distinction I often uh, tell students between the House and the Senate is the House is designed to empower the majority party. If you are a member of the majority party in the House and your party is unified as it is now, you work at the behest of the Speaker. Um, the Speaker is your um, focal point, not only for leadership, but she articulates your views as a party and hopefully does so in a way that helps your brand name, helps you get reelected. That's less the case in the Senate. The minority party in the Senate through um, things like the filibuster still wields, um, the Senate operates under something called unanimous consent, which as the name suggests, in order to do anything, you typically need unanimous consent of all the Senate members. There's ways around that. But it generally means in the Senate, the minority party has much more uh, ability to gum things up than the minority party in the House does. And that means the minority party leadership in the Senate, Chuck Schumer now for the Democrats, um, is often seen consulting with Mitch McConnell, the majority party leader, in a way that you do not see the Republican ranking leadership in the House wielding any influence with Nancy Pelosi. It's Nancy Pelosi's show as long as she can keep her party together. And now that's been an issue in the past few years, right? I, you think of some ultra liberal members who like the squad, for yeah. example, led by AOC, there is more dissent in the parties or right now with the COVID relief bills in the Senate, um, you've Mitch McConnell openly admitting that he doesn't think he can get his entire caucus on board to vote for any COVID relief. Um, so is that just, it's still present, it's just not as omnipresent as it used to be? Well, you raise a great point, because as a majority party in the House becomes larger, you begin to see fractures, um, and uh, you've put a finger on a very important development within the Democratic Party, which is as the party has moved left, and in the current electoral cycle, you've seen a number of incumbent Democrats being defeated in the nominating process, and they've been defeated by individuals to their left mm -hmm. uh, in the Democratic Party. Um, and that's how parties evolve over time. But that evolution takes place um, by creating tension within the party. So on certain issues, the squad, um, the four progressive members and others who support them have sometimes sought to break with the leadership, which they have saw as perhaps too cautious. Remember, if you're Nancy Pelosi, you have two goals. One is you've got to run the house. You've got to get things done. You are the institutional leader of the house. But also, you're the head of your party. And sometimes those roles come in conflict. As leader of the house, you want to get bills passed and get them out there and get things done. As leader of your party, sometimes better to take a stand symbolically, um, even if you know that stand isn't going to produce anything. Think about the impeachment process. Everybody knew the impeachment process would not lead to Donald Trump's removal. But it was important for the Democrats to stake out for symbolic purposes where the Democratic Party stood. So yeah, uh, even in a majority controlled house, 
within the majority itself, you sometimes can see fractures. The Senate, even more so, because uh, ostensibly Mitch McConnell as the majority leader has to run that show, but he cannot do it by himself without active consultation with the minority party. For sure. So in light of this partisanship, are opportunities for bipartisan work really few and far between? They're less frequent, but they still occur. We saw early in the COVID crisis that both parties were able to pass bills, funding bills to ex uh, extend unemployment, to send relief checks, and of course, bringing the president in on this negotiation process. More recently, as you pointed out correctly, the Senate is having a problem extending those unemployment benefits. Um, the general rule of thumb is this, members of Congress are willing to cooperate if they think it is uh, the risk of not cooperating will uh, undercut their reelection chances. And what this leads to is often you see brinkmanship. Both parties essentially saying, nope, I will not compromise. This is as far as I can go. And then when we're on the edge of a, for instance, a fiscal cliff because the government is going to shut down because we have not passed an appropriations bill or appropriations resolution, a budget resolution. Then and only then, when the alternative is disaster, will members of Congress put aside their partisan differences and work. In a crisis, they're more likely to do that. After 9-11, for instance, we saw bipartisanship for a short period, bailing out the airlines, for instance, agreeing on a resolution to, um, for the so-called Bush Doctrine. Um, taking the war against the, the terrorists. But when that pressure begins to recede, partisanship begins to reassert itself. Um, and that's really what normal politics has become like. A series of crises, we lurch from crisis to crisis, um, and in between sort of bitter partisan polarization. And what role does the media have in all of this? Obviously, we kind of mentioned it, you and you were talking about the representation moving from franked envelopes to social media and whatnot. But what does this have also on like trying to get those sound bites in committee, for example, um, just so you can put out that social media, that tweet of, oh, look at Jim Jordan's taken down the Jerry Nadler. Yeah, great question, because when we say the word media, we really have to acknowledge it encompasses these many different outlets and types of media. So the traditional legacy media, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the weekend talk shows used to dominate um, sort of coverage of Congress and members of Congress were eager to get on those shows to show that to the public, to their constituents, but to the broader public that they could work on bills. But now with social media and there's so many multiple avenues in which individual members can reach directly bypassing the media, it's had two dynamics. One is it has allowed individual members to sort of uh, play up their constituent outreach. And when I say constituent, not just people who vote for them, but the interest groups that are increasingly important in funneling money to them. And that has, uh, that helps their reelection needs, but it makes it much more difficult for Congress to act collectively with you have 435 members each talking about their own message. But the other thing is, as both parties have become partisan, they have become very adept at using social media to push their brand name and at the same time criticize the other brand name. And in an electoral era in which we are on, which is unprecedented, and by this I mean competitively, we see, when you think about majority control of the House, the Senate, and whoever occupies the Oval Office, you have eight different configurations. You know, you can have all Republicans control, all Democrats or variations of split. We've gone through every configuration possible uh, over the last 20 years with the exception of one. That's because the parties are evenly balanced and it gives them an incentive to use social media to try to elevate their brand name, their party name, and to castigate the other brand name. So when we talk about media, I think that's the biggest development over the last 40 years. It's the ability of individual members of Congress to speak directly to interested parties in a way that um, they hope bolsters their electoral fortunes. Very interesting. Just to kind of wrap it up here, as we're running short on time. Um, I know I'm obviously one of your advisees and I know numerous other students of yours have um, interned or ended up working either on Capitol Hill for a member of Congress or around um, Capitol Hill, either in the media or an interest group or stuff like that. 
what type of advice do you have? Um, what type of advice do you usually give to students who are interested in stuff like that? Or what advice would you have for people listening um, who are interested in interning or, or starting to work on Capitol Hill? That's a great question, Abbott. I would say a, a couple of things. One is when you go down there, uh, whether in going down to Washington DC or going to a district office to intern, you're not gonna start out at the top writing policy documents um, that restructure the force posture of the American military, right? A lot of it's gonna be answering phones. A lot of it's gonna be engaged in rote um, constituency outreach. Don't underestimate the importance of that. And don't underestimate the importance of you doing it well. Take your job seriously. Um, you're gonna hear later in this course from another former advisee of mine, uh, Anna Esten. Anna Esten went down with no paid job. She went as an unpaid intern uh, in, in a couple of different roles. Now, I understand not everybody can afford to do this. Um, but my larger point here is she parlayed that into increasingly important responsibilities so that she ended up writing healthcare policy, um, working with Sheldon Whitehouse. Um, so take the job seriously, do it well. The other thing is, it's kind of fun. Um, if you keep your eyes and ears open, you are at the heart of government. People talk about the presidency. The presidency is nothing compared to Congress. Congress is where the action takes place. And if you pay attention to this, you can learn a lot. But also, you're at the seat of government. This is, a, this is an important thing. We sort of make fun of, uh, make fun is probably the wrong word, but we don't appreciate the fact that self-government um, is essentially how we run ourselves. And you're part of that, that governing process. I can't think of any higher column. Um, so step back and appreciate that experience as well. That, that sounds very true, at least to my experience, both in the lots of phone calls to answer and, and lots of focus on desks, the intern tasks, but it does need to, to be done well because it's a big part of, as we mentioned earlier on, representing uh, your constituents. But also it's really cool to be working in the Capitol complex and like I rode the Senate subway with Mitt Romney once. Like, unstaffed like that's pretty cool i ran into nancy pelosi in the hall um you know just like kind of those chance encounters and you're like oh like these are real people too um, yes they are anyways thank you so much professor dickinson i really appreciate uh you taking the time to speak with me i look forward to uh speaking with you and being back on campus soon thanks to everyone watching uh for joining us today hope you learned something uh and we hope you join us for future episodes uh both in this mid series and others uh, stay healthy and stay in touch. Thank you very much.